So I would like to talk about the word psychedelic and why we are using that word. It really is about manifesting of the mind. The permeability between the conscious and the unconscious mind seems to change. And we understand ourselves in a different way when we take these substances. So we're actually talking about psychedelic medicine here. Now, science and how we structure knowledge is extremely limited when it comes to psychedelics. And it's limited because of the funnel effect. So the questions that get asked, thought of, funded, written up, and published, and passed peer review, all of those stages increases the funnel effect. And so eventually, from all of the questions that we could ask, which is the top of the funnel, and the little drop of knowledge that comes out of the bottom of the funnel, it's incredibly restrictive. There's a huge range of things that people are talking about there in academia around psychedelics. Early on in Canada and in Vancouver, this is um, one of the sites in which really psychedelic research flourished in the 60s and early 70s. Our study here is the first time in over 40 years that there's been psychedelic research in Canada. So it took a lot of uh, time to work through Health Canada and get the permissions, but it feels like um, a return to some of the origins. And so I'm really proud and honored and humbled to, to be working here in Vancouver to try to start psychedelic research. So the whole linchpin of our strategy is based on the fact that there are people right now at regulatory agencies around the world, particularly in the FDA, that have decided to, to permit the renewal of research with psychedelics and marijuana. And that they would evaluate these drugs the same way they evaluate other drugs. So we've since embarked on an international series of phase two pilot studies. And the purpose of these phase two studies is to develop information in order to design the phase three studies. The phase three are the large scale multi-site studies. Those are the ones that count to make uh, prove safety and efficacy in order to make a drug into a prescription medicine. MDMA will never be a, like a normal prescription drug because it's MDMA-assisted psychotherapy. So it will always be administered as a medicine under supervision of psychotherapists, which makes it easy from a regulatory point of view to control it because it's not a take-home drug. And by 2021, we'll have hopefully gotten MDMA as a prescription medicine. And it, it's going to cost us, so far it's been about $4 million dollars it's probably going to cost another 16, 18 million dollars. And we're finding the donors, we're finding the support. We've had incredible discussions just last week with the Department of Defense and the Veterans Administration. We're working with the National Institute of Mental Health. When people are in crisis, like the Department of Defense, like the military is, they're willing to consider unusual circumstances. And I think we're now in a world in crisis and we are now at a place and a time when the culture is ready, I believe, to integrate psychedelics. I think we have a chance like we've never had before. Perhaps one day billions of people can have these mystical experiences of connection, and that will be the foundation of a more peaceful world. And it's all going to be built here in Vancouver on our MDMA PTSD study, which we're really glad that you're all here to help us launch. A few years ago, Dr. Mate teamed with three Western Ayahuasqueros trained in the traditional indigenous Shipibo use of ayahuasca under the guidance of a master curandero to develop four to five day retreats called the Working with Addictions and Stress Retreats. Despite the severity of the trauma and addiction reported by participants, and I should mention that some participants had failed traditional addictions treatment up to seven times. Uh, statistically significant improvements were demonstrated for scales assessing hopefulness, empowerment, mindfulness, and quality of life, meaning an outlook. Additionally, participants reported statistically significant reductions in problematic cocaine use, and self-reported alcohol and tobacco use also declined. Dr. Mate received a cease and desist order from Health Canada's Office of Controlled Substances regarding his therapeutic work with ayahuasca, stating that, and I quote, if you do not immediately cease all regulated activities within 30 days, we will contact the Royal Canadian Mounted Police for enforcement action. Dr. Mate has agreed to comply with this demand. Needless to say, governments and corporate uh, funding and for scientific research is inevitably a, a politicized process, and it's incredibly difficult to find funding for research and a therapeutic potential of currently illicit substances, whether it be cannabis or psychedelics, through traditional channels. MAPS and MAPS Canada provided funding, expertise, and support 
throughout this project and we're forever grateful for their support. It's been a dream of mine for the last 30 years to be able to do this. And I also have a dream that all of you here, because you're here and you're motivated to learn more about this, that you too will be able to do this research. So this hopefully will be the beginning of a lot of you being able to become therapists, to become um, workers, scientists, people who are able to really look into how and why does this work. All the cultures that have used psychedelics or sacred plants as they know them in their culture, they've all been part of their culture and it's been elders that teach young people how to use them. And it's my dream that this can be so in our lives. With Donna, we, we started a nonprofit. We were able to hold briefly IND number 3250 for LSD. We were able to import LSD from Switzerland and uh, we were just about to begin our process when we got a stop order from the FDA. And they finished their threats. That's the reason I'm in Canada today. And I thought in coming to Canada, it meant the end of the possibility of being able to work with psychedelics. And I'm so glad that it doesn't mean that. Those who make a difference do so because they're different, because they're prepared, if necessary, to walk thousands of miles, learn as many languages as needed, word by word, ignore the warnings, and rewrite the rules, push back the barriers of the impossible. And that's the work that we're engaged in here. And then the writer adds, and there's something else too, there are also those humble facts that, if only given the chance, will speak louder than the strongest fears. And those are the facts that we're in search of bringing to the eyes and ears of the public and of the healing professions and of governments. So let me tell you something about PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. It's not a discrete entity that strikes some people and leaves the rest of us untouched. The reality is that in one way or another, to one degree or another, many people in our society are traumatized. Western medicine, and when I say Western medicine, I mean the uh, traditional allopathic medicine in which I was trained, is really wholly inadequate in dealing with it. It does not even understand it. It sees it as disease. It's not a disease. What it actually is, it's a normal response to an abnormal situation. So then, how do we then deal with it? Well, we have this uh, method, which is what Richard and, uh, and Donna will be studying, and, and Rick has been talking about MDMA-assisted MDMA psychotherapy. Psychotherapy has a very interesting origin. Psyche, of course, is not the mind at all, it's the soul in Greek language. And therapy means to attend to or to care for. So properly speaking, psychotherapy is the care of the soul. And the Buddha said, of course, that it's with our minds that we create the world. So that how we see the world is the world we're going to live in. What the Buddha didn't say, and this is the work of modern psychotherapy, if you will, is that before with our minds we create the world, the world creates our minds. Psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy, at its best, takes us back to where we are not what the world created in us, but who we actually are, without condition. And that is why, uh, very uh, astutely, a Hungarian-born American psychiatrist called Thomas Hora said that all problems are psychological, but all solutions are spiritual. Here's the quote I'd like to give you to complete my talk. Times change are always slipping, shifting. Things that once were necessary, allowable, are not even possible anymore because the energies and opportunities are no longer the same. Suddenly, the directions of life have switched and a new path opens up for us ahead, full of obstacles to begin with, but easier and easier for anyone to follow as soon as the first travelers have cleared the way. Before we know it, yesterday's impossibility will be tomorrow's laziness. Thank you.